Um, thanks, everybody. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's actually really cool for me to be here in St. Louis because um, uh, I worked here as a pediatric surgeon in the 1990s. Um, and one of my main teachers here was, was uh, this woman, Jessie Turnberg, who was one of the first women to become a pediatric surgeon in uh, North America. Um, she was the chief of pediatric surgery at St. Louis Children's Hospital for probably 30 years. And uh, she was at the tail end of her career when, when I was working here. And so uh, I learned a tremendous amount from her and I just wanted to dedicate this to her. She was uh, an amazing woman. She died about five or six years ago, I think in her late nineties. So <clears throat> I'm not going to um, talk about the operations again. I, a lot of times I start these talks with just a quick uh, review of the different operations, but you just heard that from Dr. Shachar, so we don't need to do that. But the basic principle is <clears throat> to remove the bowel that has no, no nerve cells and bring the normal bowel down to the anus um, without interfering with the function of the anal sphincter. And, um, and then there's a variety of different ways you can do that, which we already talked about. I also <clears throat> want to, <clears throat> excuse me, I got over COVID about two weeks ago, so I'm still struggling a bit. Um, and it's a good thing that everybody's sitting like way over there, I guess. Um, uh, I, I wanna talk a little bit about the operations for total colonic ganglionosis, even though it's only five to 10% of children with Hirschsprung disease, it, it, it does tend to be a higher percentage of kids that have ongoing problems. And I think there's probably a disproportionate number of families in reach and at these, um, these sessions that have children with total colonic. So um, the, the first option for a child with total colonic Hirschsprung disease is just a pull through, just using one of these other techniques that you just heard about. But instead of bringing colon down, you're bringing small bowel because the entire colon is missing nerve cells. And um, in many of the kids with total colonic, it's not just the colon, there is a, a segment of the small bowel as well that's, mass, that's missing nerve cells. And it can be more than just a little bit. So um, that can become even more complicated. So you can do just a straight pull through using one of these techniques that we already talked about. Um, there were a couple of operations designed um, years ago to try and utilize the colon to absorb water, because that's what the colon does, um, to leave an extended amount of colon in um, so that you had the small bowel, which had the normal motility, the, the pushing motion, um, and then leaving some of this uh, colon behind in an attempt to absorb more water so the stools wouldn't be as, uh, as loose and, and runny. Um, this was the, um, the operation designed by Lester Martin in Cincinnati. And there was another operation that was a little more complicated designed by uh, Ken Kimura <clears throat> that used the right side of the colon because it's actually more effective in absorbing water. And that required several different procedures. Uh, and you ended up with this kind of colon patch. Um, both of these operations um, turned out not to be very good. They were great in the first year or two of life. But uh, what ended up happening to that um, abnormal colon with no nerve cells is over time, over years, it would get very dilated and um, the bacteria would end up growing in it. They'd end up with chronic enterocolitis. So most of the people who have had these operations have, have had to have that patch of colon removed um, later on. But I'm mentioning it because you may read about it or some there may be still some surgeons doing these operations. And so it's worth knowing about. The other thing that's sometimes done is uh, the operation that we do for children with ulcerative colitis who have to lose their colon uh, or polyposis who have to have their colon removed, just creating a pouch out of the small bowel and hooking it up just uh, above the anus. This has not really been very popular in North America, but uh, in Scandinavia in particular, this is often the operation that's done for total colonic Hirschsprung. So <clears throat> most of what I wanted to talk about today is the problems that kids with Hirschsprungs can have even after they've had their pull through surgery. And you can characterize or classify these problems into three categories. One is um, persistent obstructive symptoms, unable to empty abdominal distension, chronic constipation. The second is soiling. And the third is enterocolitis. So I'll, I'll deal with these each in turn. There are basically five reasons why a child might have continued obstruction, obstructive symptoms after having a pull through. <clears throat> the first one is mechanical, a mechanical blockage. 
And usually that's related to the operation itself. Um, this is an example of a stricture, a very tight narrowing where the where the bowel was put together. And for usually because of poor blood supply or tension, um, that scars down and becomes very narrow. <clears throat> and, and these kind of mechanical obstructions you can usually diagnose with a rectal exam, just a just examining the patient, um, which was harder and harder to do during COVID, but now thankfully we can get back to that, um, and, a, and a contrast or barium enema. So that's an example of a stricture. Uh, this is a child who had a Duhamel operation and um, the that uh, joining up the staple that's used to to join these two things, this is, this is the original rectum and this is the pull through, that staple line fused back again and, and this big um, native rectum that didn't have any uh, nerve cells couldn't empty and it slowly filled up with stool and caused obstruction. And this is something we see after the Duhamel sometimes. This is an example of, um, of a child where when the pull through was being done, the bowel got twisted and that caused <clears throat> obstruction as well. So these are just some examples of mechanical obstruction, but our job as a surgeon in a child who has persistent obstructive symptoms, the first thing we need to rule out is some kind of mechanical blockage. The second thing that can happen is that the bowel we pull down, we always try and bring down bowel that has normal nerves, that's gonna have normal uh, propulsive function, but sometimes that doesn't happen for a variety of reasons. And <clears throat> the way we diagnose that is by doing another rectal biopsy. So a child who's had a pull through, who's having persistent obstructive symptoms, you make sure there's no mechanical obstruction. And the next thing is do a rectal biopsy to make sure that the ganglion cells in that pull through are normal. And why can they be abnormal? Well, one, is <clears throat> one reason is that when we did the biopsy at the time of the pull through, the pathologist may have told us, yeah, this looks like normal bowel, but in fact, it wasn't normal bowel. It, it, it was abnormal. It may have been missing the ganglion cells or maybe in the transition zone. And I'll show you an example of that. Um, and in very rare cases, the, the pull-through could have been done completely correctly with normal ganglion cells, but for one reason or another that we don't understand, those ganglion cells may have disappeared. And you saw this picture, I think, before, but actually, this is just an example that the, the transition zone is not symmetrical. So when we do the surgery, we do a biopsy, and we might have done the biopsy like right here and found normal ganglion cells. But in fact, most of the circumference of that bowel that we pulled down didn't have ganglion cells. So there are strategies that surgeons use to try and prevent that from happening. But if you have abnormal pathology, then the function of that bowel is, is not going to be normal and you'll have persistent obstruction. The third thing is that the bowel that we pull down, even though it might have normal ganglion cells on pathology, it might not have normal function. And I don't know, Shannon, if you're going to talk a little bit about this, but sometimes we have to check after we've ensured that there's no mechanical obstruction and the biopsy looks normal. Sometimes we have to check to make sure the, the peristalsis, the propulsion of that bowel we've pulled down is, is normal. And there are a variety of techniques uh, that can be used for that. The, the fourth reason why you might have obst obstructive symptoms is that the sphincter muscle in kids with Hirschsprung's disease is not normal in the sense that it doesn't relax normally. And that's the result of there not being normal nerve cells in there. Um, <clears throat> in, normal, in normal people without Hirschsprung's disease, if you blow up a balloon in the rectum to distend it, there's a reflex called a rectoanal inhibitory reflex or RARE, you may hear that term, R-A-I-R, where if you blow up a balloon, the sphincter muscle as a reflex relaxes, the pressure goes down. And that's that makes sense because when somebody's rectum gets full, you want to relax the sphincter to try and get rid of that stool. Um, kids with Hirschsprung's disease, every, every kid with Hirschsprung's disease is missing that reflex. And sometimes the kids have trouble pushing the stool through the sphincter that's not relaxing normally. <clears throat> and the way we, um, we, we can do manometry, and Shannon will talk about that, but the manometry isn't that helpful in this case because every kid with Hirschsprung's is missing that reflex. Um, but what we can do is inject bo Botox, and you've probably all heard about Botox. We can inject Botox into the sphincter to relax it. And if the symptoms improve after the Botox, that suggests that, that this is the main cause of the obstructive symptoms. 
And then the fifth reason why kids can have obstructive symptoms is just that they hold the stool in, just like any kid can hold the stool in. And Hirschsprung's kids are a little bit more uh, susceptible to this problem because of that non-relaxing sphincter. So they tend to get constipated and then they pass a hard stool and it hurts. And their little two-year-old brain says, whoa, that was terrible. I'm never doing that again. And so they hold it in and hold it in and then it just worsens the problem. It becomes a vicious cycle. So we always have to be aware that that these behavioral uh, issues, these stool holding behaviors can be um, a part of the ongoing problems that Hirschsprung's kids have. And one of the ways of dealing with that is the uh, physical therapy, which we're gonna hear about, I think a little bit later. So the next problem that kids can have is, um, is soiling. And there's a variety of different reasons why kids can have soiling after a uh, pull through for Hirschsprung's. The first thing is, that they may have poor sphincter muscle control. And that's usually the result of something that happened during the pull through. Usually it's uh, the, the sphincters were stretched too much or they may have been injured. Um, and in some cases, uh, surgeons have actually cut the muscle to try and improve from the obstructive symptoms that we talked about before, um, but that will weaken the muscle and that can increase the chance of soiling. And this, that's just an example of a child who had um, a sphincter muscle injury during the pull through and you can see the, the sphincter is kind of lax there. The second thing that you need for normal continence is to be able to feel when the stool is in the rectum and when it's about to come out. And, um, there are some kids after a pull through for Hirschsprungs who end up with a very dilated rectum. And as a result of that, they can't really sense when the rectum is full. So they get a rectum that's really full of stool and they're playing in the playground or they're walking and it just kind of leaks out and they get the smears that, that are very familiar to most Hirschsprungs parents. Um, and the other thing <clears throat> that you need for normal continence is to be able to feel the difference between gas and stool. And there's this, um, this little section right at the bottom of the rectum just before it turns into skin called the transitional epithelium or the dentate line is another thing we call it. And if the operation has been done so that the connection is too low and the child has lost that normal, um, that normal epithelium that can sense the difference between stool and gas, uh, then, then they may have more and more trouble preventing accidents. And this is an example where you can see this is the lining of the rectum and it's been sewn basically right to the skin. So this child has lost that ability to, to sense the stool. So these are the loss of sphincter tone and the loss of sensation are kind of physiological reasons why kids have soiling and have problems. But there are also kids who have what we call pseudo incontinence, which means that they have normal muscle and they have normal sensation, but there's another reason why they're soiling. And there's two types of pseudo incontinence. One is kids who get terribly, terribly constipated and the stool is just leaking out all the time. Even if they have normal sphincters, they just can't control it. And this is an example of a contrast enema that shows a very dilated rectum that's full of stool. But there's also a group of children with Hirschsprung disease where they, they're not constipated. In fact, what's happened is the, the colon that's, or the small bowel and total colonic Hirschsprungs that, that has been connected to the anus is actively pushing because in normal, normal situation, your rectum is kind of there as a storage compartment, but the bowel that's up above that is really meant to push stool down. So when you, this is a child who's had a pull through, you can see that sigmoid colon is mostly gone. And then what's hooked up at the bottom, this is still peristalsing and pushing all the time. <clears throat> and that's what we call hypermotility. So these are kids who are trying to hold it in, but the bowel keeps pushing against their sphincter. And even if they have a normal sphincter, sometimes they have a lot of trouble um, keeping the stool in. And we can tell the difference between these two types of pseudo incontinence by doing a contrast enema, or in more sophisticated um, situations, you can actually measure that motility and see whether there's hypermotility or, or less. So the workup for a kid who's soiling has to include looking at the muscle and anal rectomanometry, which we'll hear about later, is a good way of, of checking the sphincter muscle pressure. 
<clears throat> you can check their sensation by blowing up a balloon in the rectum and see when they feel it. And we have to put them to sleep and, and examine them to see whether they've got that dentate line or whether that's been uh, injured by the, uh, during the operation. <clears throat> so there's a, the treatment of this problem. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that. Um, the treatment of this problem has to be based on um, a very clear understanding of what the underlying cause of the problem is. Now, there are also some kids uh, with Hirschsprung disease who also have developmental delay, and that can also interfere with their ability to be continent. And uh, we also have to, we have to manage our expectations for children who, who may have developmental delay, and even without Hirschsprung disease might have taken a lot longer to, um, to develop continence. So <clears throat> how do we make the diagnosis? We do a history. Um, as I mentioned before, you have to do an exam under anesthesia, check the dentate line, see if there's any kind of uh, stricture or other mechanical obstruction that might be causing chronic constipation and that big stool ball that's leaking out, um, and anal rectal manometry, uh, which I mentioned before. Um, and then uh, in some cases we have, uh, if we're not sure, then we can assess the colon motility and see if they have that hyperperistaltic thing. So basically you have to have a clear understanding of the underlying problem. If there's true incontinence, so that means if the sphincters are not functioning well and if they don't have normal sensation, then, the, then we're talking about bowel management and we're gonna hear more about bowel management later as well. Um, but you wanna try and keep the stools not too loose. Uh, you wanna make, keep them a little bit constipated, um, use loperamide uh, or emodium, which is uh, what it's called, a, a trade name. Um, to kind of slow things down so it's not leaking out all the time. And then we generally want to just use mechanical irrigation to, to get the empty, to get the rectum empty. So enemas, which can be from below or through a mace from uh, above. Um, and in some cases um, where kids just can't achieve continence, they're better off with an ileostomy or with a colostomy. And, um, and, and so we've had some kids where that's been the option that's been chosen by the parents. Um, so if the child has normal sensation and normal sphincter, so that's now we're talking about pseudo incontinence, if it's the constipated kind, then you need a toileting routine, high fiber diet, and we're gonna go into the bowel management. So I won't go into detail about this, but we use things like PEG, Miralax to keep the stools loose enough that they can be passed comfortably and stimulant laxatives to try and keep the rectum empty. And then um, the kids who are stool holders, you don't, I, I find it's, it's counterproductive to do rectal enemas for those kids because it just makes the stool holding worse. <clears throat> and so antigrade enemas may be a better option. Um, and then uh, biofeedback training and physical therapy, which we'll talk about later. If the stools are loose and frequent, so the hyperperistaltic type, then it's the opposite. And this is an important point because a lot of surgeons don't really appreciate, and, and gastroenterologists don't appreciate that, that the that the difference, that the treatment has to depend on what the problem is. And they just use a one, uh, you know, one, uh, one solution for everything. Um, and so if the stools are loose and frequent, they need a, a, a toilet routine, they need a constipating diet, sugars, uh, milk, gluten can all exacerbate this problem with uh, hyperperistalsis. And most importantly, don't use laxatives. Um, I, I'll often see a kid with Hirschsprungs who's incontinent and has been put on Miralax because that's what people do. They automatically assume it's Hirschsprungs, they're, therefore they're con uh, constipated, they need Miralax. And sometimes all you have to do is stop the Miralax and the stools thicken up and the soiling stops. So that's a really important point. Um, and then we'll often slow down the bowels with the uh, loperamide and there's a few other things that we can do. Um, that we can talk about later if you want more detail. So I'll talk a little bit about enterocolitis. <clears throat> the symptoms of enterocolitis are, are fever, distended abdomen, diarrhea, foul smelling stools. And these kids with enterocolitis can get extremely sick. Um, some kids present with Hirschsprungs before they've had a pull through. Their first presentation is with enterocolitis. Um, but kids can get enterocolitis even after the pull through and, and that's important. Um, and, and because they can get so sick, uh, it's important for everybody who has a child with Hirschsprungs and every doctor that's taking care of children with Hirschsprungs to recognize the symptoms and seek early medical attention. <clears throat> uh, we don't know what the cause of, um, of enterocolitis is. There's a lot of research being done um, and I don't have time to go into all of that now, but um, 
We do know that it's more common in certain populations of Hirschsprung's kids, particularly kids with long segment disease, total colonic disease, and uh, trisomy 21. And as I mentioned, it, it is the most common cause of death in children with Hirschsprung disease and can occur after the pull through. So um, what I've highlighted in, in this paper uh, is that it's, uh, we strongly recommend extensive parent education and better post-operative communication between the surgeon and the referring physician uh, so that everybody is aware of the symptoms and everybody seeks medical attention um, in a timely fashion if they develop them. The one thing about enterocolitis is that it seems to be worse in the youngest kids. And as the kids get older, usually by around age five, unless there's some underlying cause that's causing obstruction like a stricture or um, transition zone pull through or something, um, the vast majority of kids grow out of this problem. And so all we have to do is, is keep them free of enterocolitis and prevent them from getting sick. And then once they get older, uh, that it tends to not be a problem anymore in most kids. So how do we treat enterocolitis? In the acute phase, we do irrigations, and uh, most of you will know how to do irrigations. And if you don't, then you should learn because that's the treatment for enterocolitis. We clear the stool and the bacteria out of the colon. Um, if they have a very distended abdomen, we'll put down a, an NG tube. We give them antibiotics and intravenous fluids. And there are some kids that have this sort of chronic or relapsing enterocolitis. Um, they also need to be on chronic irrigations. Uh, or rectal stimulations in some cases are adequate. Um, I use metronidazole or flagyl quite liberally in these kids because it's very effective in suppressing, first in treating and then in suppressing um, the recurrent episodes of, of enterocolitis. Um, some people have tried probiotics. There've been a couple of randomized trials that haven't really shown efficacy, but I think in individual patients, sometimes it is helpful. So something to talk to your doctor about. <clears throat> Botox, we talked about before, does re does relax the anal sphincter, can decrease the amount of backup of bacteria in the colon, and there is some evidence that if you uh, have a child with recurrent or chronic enterocolitis, that using Botox may help to prevent hospital admissions for enterocolitis. And in some kids, um, they just can't seem to stop getting enterocolitis no matter what we do, and giving them an ileostomy or a colostomy is... Uh, the only way to really keep them safe. And in most of those cases, once they get old enough, like over around age five or six, when the enterocolitis becomes much less of a problem, a lot of them can get that ileostomy or colostomy closed up again. Um, I just wanted to mention the Hirschsprung's alert card, which REACH um, has developed, and I think is really, really helpful to um, for families when they go to an emergency room worried about their kid having enterocolitis because uh, it has all of the uh, the instructions for the, the the doctor in the emergency department who may never have even heard of Hirschsprung's disease, never mind, never have heard of uh, enterocolitis. So this has been a really uh, useful tool. Um, and then there's the Hirschsprung passport, which hopefully will be converted to kind of a, a um, an electronic passport that you'll have on your phone that will also um, give in important information to the primary care providers when you bring your child to the emergency department. So in summary, most children with Hirschsprungs do very well after surgery. You know, I've spent the last half hour talking about all the problems that can happen, but many, many children do very well after, after their pull through. And most of the problems that they do have, the obstructive symptoms, the uh, soiling issues and enterocolitis, most of them do improve over time. And, um, and uh, Dr. Shakshir showed you that uh, the, the data that actually documented that that is the case. Um, and this, this is Jesse Turnberg again. This is a patient um, of, of hers that uh, I met when I moved to St. Louis. Um, he was born with total colonic plus about two thirds of his small bowel that were aganglionic. And in fact, at the hospital where that diagnosis was made, they decided they were gonna treat him palliatively <clears throat> and uh, just, just let him go. And the mom said, there's no way that's happening. She found Dr. Turnberg and brought him to Children's and she did a number of different operations for him. He would required intravenous nutrition for a long time. And uh, this is, this is um, his name is Mark. This is Mark with Dr. Turnberg when he was uh, about 10 years old. And this is when he was about uh, 25 years old. So an example of how kids with Hirschsprungs can have Many, many problems when they're uh, when they're little, but uh, most of them do get better over time, and that's the trajectory that we all need to be looking at. 
Um, and then the other thing is that effective management <clears throat> of these problems has to be based on a clear understanding of the underlying problem. And um, the APSA, Hirsch, APSA is the American Pediatric Surgical Association, and we've we've got a Hirschsprung's interest group that um, Dr. Goldstein and I kind of manage. And um, we meet once a year and we've done a, a lot of um, work on trying to create algorithms or decision-making tools for surgeons and gastroenterologists to, uh, to help them to kind of figure out what's going on with these patients. And we've published these and I'm not gonna go through it, but this is the algorithm for obstructive symptoms. And this is the algorithm for children with soiling. And, and I think that's been very, very helpful. And REACH has been very um, helpful with the APSA interest group as well. Um, Eric usually comes to our meetings every year and, uh, and tells the surgeons what's happening and what REACH is doing. And, uh, and I think Eric learns a lot from, uh, from the surgeons as well. So I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Eosinophilic esophagitis and Hirschsprung's disease. I, that might, maybe Shannon knows the answer to that. I don't think so. Um, ex, there is eosinophilic colitis, which sometimes occurs in children with Hirschsprung's and can give them um, the kind of diarrhea symptoms that, uh, that they get with the hyperperistalsis. And doing colonoscopy and a biopsy is very helpful to make that diagnosis so it can be treated. We, we do know that kids with Hirschsprung's are more likely to have gastroesophageal reflux. So the stomach contents coming back up. That's, it's part of kind of the diffuse motility disorder that, her, that kids with Hirschsprung's have. And, and reflux can be associated with eosinophilic esophagitis as well. And, you know, when we have a child who's got symptoms of reflux, uh, when we do the scope and the biopsies, we're always checking to see if they have eosinophilic esophagitis because that, that's treatable and, and, um, and it's often not recognized. I think for the person who asked the question about EOE and HD, is the eosinophilic colitis, is that an autoimmune phenomenon like we think of with EOE, or is that a secondary reaction to the underlying Hirschsprung disease? Excellent question. And, and like probably 90% of the questions that we ask about Hirschsprung's disease, the answer is, I don't know. Shannon, do you have a, an answer for that? <laughs> No, that's, I mean, Hirschsprung's disease, I've been working with Hirschsprung's disease patients and I've been interested in Hirschsprung's disease my entire career. And I, there's still, you know, 10 times more things I don't understand than, than I do understand about Hirschsprung's disease. This may be one of those, but I've always been interested in the um, kids who get a viral illness and then it seems like their gut shuts down. And we treat it like we're treating enterocolitis sometimes, but enterocolitis presents the opposite way, usually with explosive diarrhea and distension. So I wonder if you could maybe contrast the two and why do kids, when they have a viral illness with Hirschsprung, have this response? Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. And, and it's something that's not uh, really recognized by many people who take care of Hirschsprung's kids, that, that uh, getting a viral illness, and it doesn't have to be a GI virus. It can be a respiratory virus. Um, and we saw this during COVID when kids got COVID also. Um, and, and other stresses as well. Sometimes just a general anesthetic to have their tonsils out or, or something like that will shut down their, their intestines. They, they, they develop a dysmotility syndrome and it can last for a couple of weeks. Um, and, and you're right that it, it, we often treat it as if it were enterocolitis. I don't necessarily think it is the same thing as enterocolitis, but I think it does, re it does result in uh, bacterial overgrowth in a lot of the kids um, and, and they develop distension. And so we do, I do end up treating them with uh, metronidazole and irrigations and, and just kind of, and hydration, because a lot of times they can't keep anything down. So they often end up in the, in the hospital for a, a week, um, just waiting for things to reverse themselves. Um, but <clears throat> we don't, you know, one, one of the areas of gastroenterology that is the most poorly understood is, is motility, is how the bowel uh, pushes the, the, the food from one end to the other. Um, and I, why that's received less, um, less attention than things like inflammatory bowel disease or, you know, colon cancer, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's just not as common. Uh, but the, the kids with Hirschsprung's disease are an excellent example of kids who have some kind of underlying motility disorder and, and uh, s stress of any kind can shut down their, their balance. 
Uh, Dr. Langer, I was wondering if maybe you could elaborate a little bit. You had said that kids tend to, by the time they hit the age five, uh, we see a lot more kids that come in with enterocolitis. But then what happens to kids, do you think, between those teen years? Because we were talking about that briefly, about how, and it's been said a few times this morning, how kids seem to show up with fewer and fewer problems. We don't necessarily know why, but could you just kind of elaborate a little bit on those markings and what, if any, there's any link to anything that explains that? Yeah, so the, I guess it's like the, you said, there are, there are really kind of two periods of time where things improve. One is around age five and the, and the actual obstructive problems and, and soiling um, tend to get somewhat better and enterocolitis seems to disappear unless there's some other underlying cause. Uh, but then when the kids get to be teenagers, they, they seem to do even better. And I'm not sure if they're actually physiologically any better but I think they just get smarter and more independent and they learn how to manage those problems. Because those problems, you know, if you look at the long-term data, the long-term outcomes, you know, people in their 20s and 30s and 40s, if you ask them, are you having problems with your, a lot of them will say, yeah, I'm still having problems, but does it affect their quality of life the same way as it did when it, they were 10? No, because they've learned how to figure it out and, uh, and, and manage it. So that's, that's my guess is that we're actually, there's, not, there's nothing physiological that happens. It's just that they get better at, at managing the problems. I don't know. What do you think, Alan? Or... <clears throat> yeah. I was thinking about this same question when you were talking and um, I don't, there's nothing that changes in your gut physiology that I'm aware of when you're, you know, a teenager, you sort of, so I imagine it is that, that you learn what foods work, you learn how to push and defecate differently than other people maybe. Right. We smarter people here who can think of this. <laughs> Seem to have less there seems to be a less trips to the emergency room things don't seem the severity of even if they're still physiologically haven't changed the severity of the incident seem to become less so it makes me wonder if maybe there's some thing to being physically stronger having that ability to push more having that sort of core strength i'm not sure yeah maybe maybe i i think uh, i think we don't know but i can like i've i've got a whole bunch of kids now with total colonic Hirschsprungs that I've managed over my career and some of them are in their 20s and 30s now um, and I if I just think about you know what are the differences when they get older I, I think they they recognize the things that exacerbate those symptoms for example um, sugar is really bad for kids with especially total colonic Hirschsprungs it's just it causes diarrhea it it causes perianal you know the, the bad rash and everything um, and try telling an, an eight-year-old, you know, don't eat sugar, don't drink sugary drinks. Uh, they're going to do it anyway. But once they get to be older, 15, 16, and, you know, into their 20s, they don't want to have those symptoms anymore. And they can understand that if they drink a thing of Coke, that they're going to suffer. So they'll they'll do it once in a while. But they're, most of the time, they're going to say, I, I don't really want to do that anymore. So I think it's just a matter of maturity and making better choices and just handling things better. Excellent. Um, so when I think about as a parent, now it's 15 years ago, 16 years ago, the most frightening and vulnerable time was at birth for us. And um, we also at REACH get a lot of, you know, frantic inbound yeah. uh, um from parents who are during this most uh, frightening time. And I, then I think about what you guys have talked about with regard to diagnosis and the pathology and how there seems to be, um, that, that's a really critical um, moment because if you get the transition zone wrong or if you don't do things properly, um, it has a lifetime impact. So can you talk a little bit about some of the innovations or directions that we need to go around pathology and diagnosis, maybe for both? Yeah. Batter, maybe you can, that was 
part of your uh, your talk. So like innovations that have improved our ability to make the diagnosis of Hirschsprungs and identify the transition zone intraoperatively so we don't have this problem of transition zone pull through. Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. Um, there are, um, surgically in terms of technique wise, I think it was actually your paper here with Francis White, who's still practicing just a few miles down the road that looked at what is the length of the transition zone. And so I think uh, we've learned that that length at max will be four to five centimeters. And so when we identify ganglion cells, if it's surgically possible to just go back five centimeters and so to take a little bit of extra bowel just to avoid the problem altogether. Um, sometimes that's not possible, especially in the longer segment disease, because you're really talking about changing the operation fundamentally. Um, but that's certainly probably the easiest kind of upfront option. Um, there has been more and more uh, investigation as to can we get a secondary way to identify what is going on with the bowel. Um, we, you know, classically, we, we showed pictures of what's called H&E staining or that kind of purple and pink stain. Um, we have been much more aggressive early on with acetylcholesterase straining, which was a, another, another marker of Hirschsprung disease. But recently, calretinin staining has come on as a even more sensitive and specific way for the pathologist to look at things. I think the problem with that is that that pathology still takes a couple of days to come back. You can't get that on quote frozen section or kind of immediately my child is in the operating room and asleep. Can you give me the answer? Um, there are other people who have looked at technologies for diagnosing Hirschsprung disease. Um, uh, there's some work out of Riley Children's looking at this, uh, the idea of like an electronic nose. <laughs> um, that's still very early on and it's in its, it's, it's, its infancy. And so we don't know. We don't know if that's just going to be a yes, no output or a uh, how things are going output. You know, as, as Dr. Langer said, our understanding of motility and how this actually works and even being able to relate the pathology findings to the actual outcome findings is still um, crude. Dr. Goldstein, did you want to add anything else? No, no that, that was really, th there's a lot of uh, research and things like um, confocal endomicroscopy or these fancy optical imaging methods so that maybe one day we can just do a, put a scope in and see the nerve cells without having to take a biopsy. But the, um, the problem is at the end of the day, it's the, the remain, even if you removed all the aganglionic and all the transition zone, it seems, at least in mouse models and some studies in humans, that the remaining enteric nervous system are just not normal. Like in one mouse model we use, they're missing GABAergic neurons. They're missing a specific type of neuron in the entire small intestine. And in others, the balance between neurons that make the gut squeeze and neurons that make the gut relax, that balance is completely perturbed. So it may be that just understanding the issues that can happen and how you manage them may be ultimately all we can you know, do until, like you said, new therapies are developed. Yeah, I would also, uh, I would also say that there's such variability in the way kids with Hirschsprungs present. You, could, you have two kids with a transition zone in their recto sigmoid in exactly the same place. One presents as a bowel obstruction as a newborn. The other one just has chronic constipation and at five years of age is finally diagnosed. Why? Why is that different? Well, it's because I think of, of other abnormalities that we haven't yet figured out in the rest of the intestine. And some of those may be coded for by the specific gene mutations that uh, we know there's many different gene mutations that uh, can cause Hirschsprung's disease. And that's the HDRC, the Hirschsprung's Disease Research Collaborative, um, is collecting hundreds and hundreds of cases of Hirschsprung's um, and trying to correlate the genetic mutations with the um, specific symptoms and responses to surgery and risk of enterocolitis and all of those outcomes. Um, and so hopefully in the future, we, we may be able to use personalized medicine based on genetic mutation to be more to kind of fine tune the surgery we do and the post-operative care that we that we deliver. So um, th those are some of the things that are on the on the horizon. I can't resist because we have such an amazing group of people here to ask another question, and that is thinking about 
the improvement of most patients over time, including total colonic patients, is there any evidence that the physiology gets better? Yeah, it depends how you define the physiology. But I the, mean, like, does the colon, if there is any that's left, does it actually self-heal? Do, or if it's total colonic, does the, uh, you know, the, 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 um, um, the, 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 small, small, the small intestine, colon. does it actually learn how to be more like a colon? And what do we know about that kind of thing? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't think that's really been studied. I mean, people, uh, you can do manometry. You can, you can measure the motility of the colon, of the, of the entire colon or the small bowel. Um, but I don't think those studies have been done, like sequential studies looking at age two versus age five versus age 10. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware that those studies have been done. But those, that, would be, that would be good research to do, I think. The other thing I wanted to mention, just you're talking about, um, you know, how, what are the things on the horizon for helping to manage these issues of pathology? We live in, in, in a very privileged environment in North America and in Europe. Most of the children in the world who have Hirschsprung disease are in the developing world. And the uh, pathology backup that they have there, the surgical uh, technology that they have. We talk about laparoscopic pull throughs. Uh, well, that's just something that's not possible for most of the children in the world that have Hirschsprung disease. So that's another area where I think we should be putting some effort is to try and figure out ways to improve the outcomes for, for those kids because they, they're they like we were in the 1940s. Uh, unless anybody has any other questions, I think we'll move to a coffee break and we'll get we'll come back around 1035, 1040. <laughs> 